Let's pray. Holy Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the gift of your mercy. We thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, to reconcile us with the Father. May we receive your mercy and be instruments of your mercy. We beg you these things, Lord Jesus, in your most holy name, amen. Mary, Mother of Jesus, pray for us. Good Saint Joseph, pray for us. And Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Okay, this afternoon we want to focus on the priest as the icon of mercy. The priest as the icon of mercy. And the scripture for it is Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, when Jesus says, go and learn the meaning. Go and learn the meaning. Isn't it something? Go and learn the meaning. It is mercy I desire and not sacrifice. Again, to go back to Pope Francis. Pope Francis, when he did the America interview, it's a great uh, line in the very beginning of the article. And he says, who is Jorge Mario Bergliano, or whatever his last name is, I can't pronounce, Pope Francis. So it says, I ask Pope Francis point blank, who is Jorge Mario? He stares at me in silence. I ask him if he would like me to ask the question again. He nods and replies, I do not know what might be the most fitting description. I am a sinner. Now this is, not mo this is the most accurate de definition. It's not a figure of speech or literary genre. I am a sinner. So here's the Holy Father introducing himself to the world, if you will, in this intimate interview with American Magazine. And he starts off by saying, I'm a sinner. And I always... Uh, often go crazy with people only focus on themselves you know I'm just a sinner I'm a sinner I'm a sinner I say well get over yourself huh go ahead and do something but this is where he begins and this is where we need to begin knowing who we are but remember how he ends this a beloved son so he can be a beloved father so though he is a sinner he knows he's beloved to the father he knows and that's why he's such an instrument of that mercy so first of all to receive it you know, again, I told you when I was uh, a young teenager, I went to confession and the priest yelled at me, screamed at me. And again, some people would say, you deserve it. You know, and so and it was in front of the Blessed Sacrament and he, he, he made me feel like the God of the universe of anything didn't want anything to do with me except call me and tell me I was a sinful person. And then again, all of us, when we come into the presence of the Holy God, all of us are unworthy. That's not the problem. We can't stay sinners. We need to be redeemed sinners. And so when we come into the presence of our Father, our Father, of course, does everything in his power to save us, right? God does everything in his power as God to save you and me. And so to think about that the God of the universe, even the whole reality of sin, when God told him, if you do this, you will die. And then God says, okay, how am I going to help my people know that I love them? I know I will become one of them. I know I will become one of them and I will take their sins upon myself. I myself will pay for their sins. That's grace, huh? That we can't do it ourselves, so God says, I'll do it for you. Now that's pretty good. And that's what we're saved. I love the, you know, every time for the Advent services, I always make sure we use the Gospel of Matthew. And it says, and you will name him Jesus. Why? because he will save his people from their sins. That the whole reason Jesus Christ was born was to save us from our sins. And again, so often when it comes to confession, <laughs> I was once, oh, about my, my confession CD come out, you know, uh, years ago. It's over almost three million throughout the world now. And when it was, uh, you know, out for a couple years, I get a call one day, and I'm still teaching at the high school, and it was this guy, and he was a priest, Never met him before. He was from somewhere. He's an older priest. And he says, Father Larry? I go, yes. He says, Some Father so-and-so, and I'm in town. I said, oh, well, okay, Father. What can I do for you? He says, well, I've been sitting here in the hotel the last couple of days waiting to go to confession to you. Huh? I said, well, why? He just he could have called me. And he flew from south somewhere. And I said, Father, you should just, no, no, no. This is what I need to do. And so he says, can I? He says, it's been 20 years, Father. 
can I come? And I said, of course, huh? And it was a, something that we won't go, of course, into, but here's a priest that hadn't been to confession in 20-some years, and he really needed to get rid of some stuff. And I was so happy to Almighty God that this person could feel that he could confess anything and still feel loved and not judged. That when we come to the God of mercy, the reason, you know, the deepest thing, of course, is God hates sin, right? He hates sin. Not because we're sinners. He hates sin because it stops us from being sons and makes us slaves. And that's why God hates sin. Because it stops us from being sons and makes us slaves. And he created us to be sons. And he always wants to redeem us and help us to experience his mercy. You know, I go to confession every two weeks to a month. And, you know, it's great with all of us in the diocese. My classmates come over, I'll say. They come over for a drink. I don't know if you ever drink with your classmates or anything more than pop. And anyway, but before we get started, they'll say, like I'll say to Nick or I'll say to me or I'm on senior Bible, I'll say, okay, before we have a drink, I need to go to confession. Can we go to confession? Sure, I know we'll go to confession to each other. And for me, it's a great thing to be able to be with a brother and be able to just get rid of my sins and to know that what changes us, of course, is not the judgment of God. It never has changed anybody, the judgment of God. What changes people is the love of God, right? Again, think about the woman caught in adultery. I just, you know, I just love this because, again, yeah, people are so focused on the rules sometimes. Well, here's the God of the universe, Jesus Christ, who wrote the commandments. He knows all about the commandments. He's the one that wrote them. He's the God of the universe. And they throw the woman, and they catch her, and they throw her in the act of adultery, and they throw her before him. And says, this woman was caught in the very act. <laughs> You're going to talk to the priest. We all know this. This woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And then he just sits down and he starts writing on the ground. We have no idea what he wrote, unless your sister Joan Shittister. She knows what he wrote. You know, sister Joan's from Erie, you know. So she was once giving a talk and he says, do you know what Jesus Christ wrote when he sat down and was writing on the ground? What is that? She must have great insight. He wrote, where is the man? But anyway, that's all beside the point. We have no idea what he wrote when he was on the ground writing. But some theologians talk about what he wrote was the, just the commandments. We have no idea. But then he gets up and he says, those who are without sin cast the first stone. And please don't bring the joke in about the Blessed Mother carrying a big rock. That doesn't count here. But the reality is, he <laughs> explain it to the person. I don't know. Anyway, so he comes and does anyone condemn you? Everybody leaves, of course. Does anyone condemn you? No one, sir. And then here's the God of the universe with someone who is caught in adultery. He made the law and he made the punishment. They shall be stoned to death. All right? Neither do I condemn you. But then he said, go and sin no more, which a lot of people forget to put in there. <laughs> go and sin no more. And when the Holy Father makes statements like this, who am I to judge? They think the world's hearing him say, oh, go ahead and keep doing it. That's not what he's saying at all, as we all know. But what changes us is love. When Jesus was caught with, when Zacchaeus was there, and he says, Zacchaeus, come down here. I'm going to have dinner with you today. What changed Zacchaeus was love. Before God gave the Ten Commandments to his people, what did he do? He set them free from their slavery first. And when he experienced they were freed from their slavery, then he says, do you love me? These are my commandments. But freedom came before command. Once I was giving a talk in Akron, and it was a theology in the body talk. I don't know, not theology in the body. It had nothing to do with it. It was a um, theology on tap. You know, I've been to a theology on tap that they have them around here where you go and you have some beers. It's at a bar and you give a talk. And of course, I can't have a beer because I'm giving the talk. But it was all young adults. And uh, Afterwards, we had questions and answers, and they had this young guy who was quite righteous, you know, good guy, you know, when people first come to Christ, they can be very, very righteous, and so he raised his hand, and he says, Father, how are we going to get people to stop having sex before marriage? Now, he heard of my tradition, and he thought that I'd come and say, well, just tell them they're all going to hell, and if we'd say that, they'll always come back to us, well, <laughs> at least all my friends will be there then, huh? 
You know, remember Billy Joel, his song, I'd rather, the, only the good die young, and the one line is, I would rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints, which of course is a lie. There's no such thing as the communion of the damned. There's only the communion of saints. If you go to hell, you're alone forever. If you go to heaven, we love each other and God, and he loves us forever. So it's the exact lie from Satan himself that when we do things our way, that we're going to really have happiness forever. It's the exact opposite. But I says to him, we can't get people to stop having sex before marriage until they come to know that they're loved by God. It's just that simple. Love, we preach first. Mercy, we preach first. And then, if you love me, keep my commandments. But see, we as a church often have done it the exact opposite way. We tell people, these are the commandments, do them, you'll go to heaven. Don't do them, you're going to hell, right? And so our people walk around in fear and like, okay, and then you get the scrupulous people who are in confession every other day because they're always focused on self and they don't, they don't want to go to hell. As opposed to you are loved and what's going to transform you is the love of God. Again, when I talked last night about, or this morning, whenever I told you I'm a 53-year-old virgin, if it was only a command or if it was only a law, or I took a vow, I took a vow, so I took a vow I'd be celibate when I was 28 years old. And I was in seminary since I was 17, so I guess I just didn't have a choice. <laughs> but anyway, what keeps me a celibate isn't because I took a vow. It was because he loved me and gave his life for me. And this was the gift I gave him. I'd ask my boys when I teach, you know, all boys, I taught them morality. <laughs> and so when you teach all juniors in high school and you're teaching them morality, I'd say, gentlemen, you'd never commit adultery against your wife, would you? And they'll say, no, father. They were young. I said, why wouldn't you commit adultery against your wife? Because it's a sin and you'll go to hell? No, father. Then why wouldn't you do it? Because I'd love her and wouldn't want her and wouldn't want to hurt her. Ding, 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 ding. When we finally realize we're loved by God, that's when we start, our struggle with sin becomes much less because now it's personal. I don't want to hurt him who loves me and gave his life for me. And so I have to experience that mercy. And I think that so often, and think about it, and, and when I was younger, like the priest, when I went to the parish, when I was first assignment, there was a, a guy who built the parish there. He was an old guy. Well, he used to yell at people so bad. I don't know if they taught this and said, I have no idea. But they would yell. I mean, he would literally, and these are all grade school kids. He was the pastor. And people would always make sure they would cry if they were in his line, Monsignor's line. Because he would literally, like if they say they missed Mass on Sunday... And I'm not exaggerating in anything. I'm in for the God of the universe. He would come out of the confessional, pull the kid out of the confessional, and scream at him and say, you are a disgrace to your family. How nice. So the people would be petrified. Huh? I can't tell you how many people that I heard when I was there that hadn't been in confession in 30 years because of Monsignor. Because they were petrified. Every time they went to confession, they thought God was going to crucify, die, and bury them. And of course, I thought this, these days were gone, right? And so when I was in Rome last year in my sabbatical, and I got to be there, and the first place we went was we went over to St. Mary Major. And me and uh, the head of the, uh, the sabbatical program, we walked over there, which is a walk. And we got there, and he said, Mass, I can celebrate, and I preached at St. Mary Major. And um, the very place I preached was where the Holy Father came, and he brought his roses or the flowers the next day after he was made uh, the pope. But while we were there taking the tour of the place, um, there was the Dominicans that would, sorry, Father, there was the Dominicans that would sit there and hear confessions, huh? And so I thought, oh, I'll go to confession, huh? It'd been two weeks. And so I go into the confessional and I just tell him, Father, I'm a priest, I see the da, da, da. And I didn't do anything extremely bad, let me give you a hint. And he starts screaming at me. And I was like, shocked. I hadn't been screamed at and 25 years or 30 years and I'm saying yes father okay and I'm getting madder and madder and madder now if you ever listen to the old confession it's still on the CD from the Mary Foundation I said if you ever go to a confession and you're really sorry and the priest starts screaming at you just stop and say stop and say father stop go to hell and walk on out he'll talk about that forever you think I got in trouble for that one? Oh yeah it's not on the new CDs but anyway but you think I meant it 
absolutely positively. If you're a priest and you're yelling and screaming at people, Father, you need counseling. That's not your job to yell and scream at people in confessional when they're sorry. Now, if someone comes in and says, Father, I committed adultery and I'm going to do it again. Well, you shouldn't yell at them. You should beat them. There's a big difference there, right? Because they need to be brought to repentance. But again, though, people sit there and I just thought, really? 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 And then he gave me a rosary. And I says, I have never in 25 years given a rosary to anybody. Now, the priest I live with, <laughs> he's... Uh, a piece of work, a good guy, and I yell at him all the time, kiddingly, back and forth, because he'll often give 10 rosaries for a penance. 10. And then he yells, I says, I would never go to confession to you. There is no way in Hades that I would ever go to confession to you. 10 rosaries? Yes. And then he goes, well, you know, and he asked me, we're having dinner one night, and he says, Larry, do you enjoy priesthood? I said, I love priesthood with all my heart, and I still do. How can you love priesthood? It's suffering. It's suffering. And I said, Jerry, if that's all priesthood was, I'd have been gone a long time. It's suffering because of love, not suffering for suffering's sake. If that's what you like, go for it. They, have, they call people stuff like that to enjoy suffering for suffering's sake. This is called love. And when you're in love, there will be suffering because you're going to give away your life for others. And so we need to be the instruments of this mercy. Now, again, mercy, by definition, is giving something good to someone who doesn't deserve it, right? That's the definition of mercy, giving something good to someone who doesn't deserve it. And so I loved it when the Holy Father did go over to Mary Major. He had all the friars who heard confessions there, because they hear confessions there every day. He had them all come in. And then he gently <laughs> yelled at them and says, fathers... Be instruments of mercy. And I thought, you hear that, Father? Did you hear that, whoever you yelled at me? Did you hear that? Because when I walked either, I thought, if I was not a Catholic priest, and if I didn't love the church, I'd have left the church because of one person who I met in the confessional who had problems. And then I sat there, and after all the anger, then when I was praying my holy hour the next day, the Lord just convicted me, as he normally does, and he says, how do you know what that priest has gone through? For you to judge him. I want you to pray for him. And then I thought, you know, probably that priest has never experienced mercy himself. So he couldn't be the instrument of mercy to somebody else. When he comes before God, he feels that God always judges him instead of loves him. So then he judges other people the way he thinks God judges him. Until we know that when you and I come before God, Every time he has mercy on us and he loves us and it's his power of his love and mercy which transforms us, then we become that to other people. And again, that's what Pope Francis is talking about again and again and again. Mercy will redeem people. We got to be these people of mercy. Again, when I was in Orlando a couple weeks ago with the priests when I did their retreat down there, there's a lot of Irish priests from Ireland. In fact, in the, of the... Uh, the 40-some priests that were here with me, about 10 of them were all from Ireland. And it was interesting because, again, they didn't know what to do with me in the beginning. And they just kept looking at me every time I talked. And I was like, I oh, know. And so I got a, I did a, I've done the men's conference in Dublin. And I've also did uh, a, uh, in Noise, which is the, uh, the old uh, monastery, we have, every year they have a big, over a thousand high school kids from Ireland come around, all from Ireland, it's a free event, and uh, someone preaches. So I preach Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to all these high school kids. And it was all in front of the Blessed Sacrament, 24-hour adoration, out in the middle of, middle of nowhere in Ireland. And so I hit real well with these kids, and because I have dealt with that for a long time. But the day that I was speaking on mercy down in Orlando, I get an email from someone, I have no idea who it is, I responded to them, but I can't remember, He's, and I just want to share a part of this with you. He says, Dear Father Larry, my name may seem familiar to you because I was at the Irish Youth Festival in Glamock Noise, which I don't say right, but anyway. Like many young men, I struggle with masturbation and porn. I have for many years now. I've listened to a lot of talks and I read literature. I'm trying and I'm failing. Currently, I read scripture when I awake, night prayer of the church at night, daily rosary, and frequent confession. I have covenant of eyes. I have internet blocks. I fast, or at least I try to. I exercise and keep myself very busy, 
I am an intern doctor. I share the issue with the Lord, telling him it's our problem. But still I fall, once a week at least. I also do a holy hour every week. My sexuality has become an issue. I now suffer from same-sex attractions and wonder, has it stemmed from this issue? I feel inferior to almost every man I meet, and I am never happy with my physical stature. Obviously, only so much can be explained by email, but I thought I would give you a try to get some insight to see if you have any advice. I wonder if I need convincing of the gravity of my sin. I've often been told it's a habit, and it's common not to beat myself up. I'm not convinced this will send me to hell, as I immediately confess and I think the Lord sees me trying, and the struggle will not abandon me to it. Anything you could say would be helpful. So here's a kid, starting to be a doctor, and he's really struggling, and he's saying, look, I'm praying every day, I'm reading the Bible every day, I go to confession, da 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 but I'm still struggling. And so I responded with him as, first of all, don't define yourself by anything. Don't define yourself by sin. You are God's beloved son who struggles with these realities. Altogether different reality. You are God's beloved son who struggles with these sins. And because you're beloved, God hates that sin because it enslaves you whom he loves. So what I'd encourage you to do is let God embrace you in mercy, to sit there and let him love you. And again, that's a hard thing for a lot of people. And then as you come to know his love, it'll become less and less. Why? Because the greatest need in everyone's heart, and including ours, fathers, is to be loved. And we do everything, whether you know it explicitly or not, and we do everything in our power to fill the emptiness inside. Mother Teresa would talk about the people in India, were so hungry that they'd go around and they'd pick up dog dung and they would eat it to try to fill the emptiness. There are so many people that are so hungry in the world for love that they fill their heart and their souls with pornography, with sexuality, with food, with pride, with all these things to make themselves feel better inside. But the only thing that sin does is makes the whole bigger. It never fills the problem. Same with us. You know, for priests, and again, like I talked about in dealing with priests now, for I've been doing priest retreats for like almost 15 years now. And in dealing with them, there's such self-hatred there. Because, again, a lot of times, and some of the priests deal with, still deal with sins of commission, what they deal in, struggling with pornography or masturbation or lust or whatever thing. Some people still in relationships and struggle with that. But a lot of the struggle is the sins that we fail to do, our sins of omission, how we have not been the people of love, how we have not been people of prayer. You know, when I was with Father Mitch the other day, and we were talking, and we were down there, and I was just giving my talks, and at night we'd just sit there and relax, and he says, what do you think the number one problem with priests are? And I said, honestly? Yeah. I says, it's their lack of prayer. Priests just don't pray. Now, of course, with you, I'm sure it's different. But there are many priests that don't really say their bravery because they don't like it. And then if I say, do you really spend some time in prayer? I mean, every day, do you do the prayers you need to do? Are you spending it? You know, for me, it's always a holy hour. I've always done a holy hour since before I was ordained, when I entered seminary. When I was in college seminary, I spent four hours a day before the Blessed Sacrament, and every month I'd make a pustinia. No pustinia, because I thought I'll never be able to be an instrument of God unless I really know God. And so I'd make every month, I'd be a silent before the Lord and, you know, sit there and spend just time with him. And, you know, I was at a, uh, one of my kids went to St. Mary's in Baltimore. He was thrown out of the seminary, and this was only about eight years ago, five years ago, because he spent too much time in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And the, pa- the rector there, who's no longer there, he says, there is no such thing as a diocesan priest that can spend an hour a day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. I wanted to go and show Father heaven right, right, right now, like send him there is what I wanted to do, because he had never been a pastor in his life, ever. And of course, he was the rector of the seminary, oh joy, and he was telling the guys, explicit quote, unquote, you cannot be a pastor and do a holy hour. Fathers, I'm a pastor, I'm an author of four books, I speak 45 times a year, and there is never a day I don't spend a holy hour. 
I have to wake up early, or if I'm off the plane and it's 1 o'clock at night, then I'll spend it at 1 o'clock in the morning if I didn't have my chance to do a holy hour. Why? Because he's my priority. And so, the first thing we've got to really think, am I really committed to Jesus? Not committed just to prayer, but if I love him. Like again, one of the easiest things for us to do when we examine our conscience is we have two boxes in front of, in our life, right? We have the tabernacle and we have the television. Where do you spend most time in front of what box? The television or the tabernacle? And again, this isn't like sometimes people say, Larry, you make me feel guilty. I know. This has nothing to do with guilt. This has to do with if I'm in love with Jesus, I just want to spend time with Jesus. And so when I spend time with him, he isn't like me. He doesn't make us feel guilty. He makes us feel loved. And if the deepest need in all of our hearts is to be loved, then he will fill that need if we come before him with the right right mindset that we are beloved to him. You know, that priest I told you about last night, who was my spirit director, who hit me off the head when I asked, and he asked me if I knew how much God loved me. Often when I'd go to confession to him throughout, he was my director for almost 30 years. When I'd go to confession to him, he'd say, Larry, isn't it great God loves a jerk like you? I'd say, yes. But he knew me very intimately. He knew all my sins, all the things I'm most embarrassed by, and yet he never stopped loving me. But he wouldn't do that because I'm not into intimacy, right? I'm just like, I'd rather slap you, you know, God loves a jerk like you. Yes, because it's true. God loves a jerk like me. But the last time I was with him, and I'm going to confession. Well, it wasn't the last time I was with him because the last time I was with him, I uh, anointed him. But the last time I went to confession to him, and he's in his 80s, Good, holy, holy, holy man. He spent most of the day in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And he also took care of the poor every big, big time. But anyway, I go and I'm going to confession. And after confession, he always used to grab me by the hands. And at the end of confession, he looked at me and he says, Larry, look at me. I said, what, Pete? Just look at me. Okay, so I looked at him. And that makes me uncomfortable, right? And I says, yes. He says, Larry, if I have never stopped loving you, how much more will God never stop loving you? I said, okay, that's enough, Pete. <laughs> you know, that's just enough. But why? Because it's like, it makes me uncomfortable that when you and I come before God, it's his love that transforms us. And when we sin, he runs out because he loves to forgive us. He desires it. Remember what Pope Francis said? We might be tired of asking for mercy, but God is never tired about giving mercy. And if he never tires that with us, then we can't be tired for others. I hear confessions constantly, huh? In men's conferences, I hear confessions at my parish every day before Mass, every Sunday before Mass, and every Sunday after Mass. Because I'm always like, here, go, and I have an easy way for confession. You know, it's done in 60 seconds. And when I deal with high school kids at the youth conferences I've spoke at throughout the years, I have an easy way. And, I, I, and I, when I do an examination of conscience, which I will not do with you, because you all know your examination of conscience. But I make it funny. Why? Because they're petrified. Huh? Like I sit there and I tell them the story about it. The priest didn't like the word masturbation. So true story, Diocese Grant, and he says, I don't like that word, so I tell the people, I don't like the word. So if you've done it, When you go to confession, just say, Father, I loved my country. Okay? True story. So he'd go to, everybody go to confession. They'd say, Father, it's been Father five since it's been one month since I last my confession, and I loved my country four times, whatever it is. And this went on for years. Priest died. New pastor comes along. And people are going, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. I love my country six times since my last confession. And after about six months, the pastor gets up and he goes, you know, we have a very patriotic parish here. Huh? And so the kids are like, whoa, but you know what? It's the first time they ever confess that sin because they're petrified. If they were to tell Father, that Father will yell at them and they'll be judged instead of loved. I tell them, I say, Father, how far can I go before it's a sin? I say, you want to know how far you can go before it's a sin? Yes, Father. And once this, I did this in Spokane, Washington, to 2,000 kids at the end, standing ovation for a a 10-minute reflection examination of conscience. Why? Because they wanted to experience mercy, but they were always afraid. How far can you go before it's a sin, ladies and gentlemen? You want to know? Nothing below the neck, either neck. And immediately, years ago when I did this, one of my boys at the high school raised his hand immediately. And I go, what? 
He says, Father, can I turn her upside down? No, you can't turn her upside down. Do you see what I got to deal with? But again, when I'm dealing with these people, I'm telling them sins that are serious sins in a way that will make them laugh so that they know when they come to confession, I'm going to give them the mercy of God and I'm going to set them free. Gentlemen, God is dying to forgive you and to give you mercy so that you can give mercy to others. My favorite devotion is divine mercy. And I often think that what we do is we put our hand into his heart and we become the instruments of mercy to others. And as God gives his mercy and his blood and water flow through me, then all as I am is an extension of that mercy. And when I give it, I receive it. When I receive it, I give it. And thus, we become icons of mercy and bring that mercy to the world.